These red and ochre mountains eroded by the wind, this scorching desert of rock and sand, this barren, uninhabited land is a holy land. This region on the Red Sea around the Sinai that goes from the Arabian Peninsula to Egypt's eastern desert is the birthplace of great religions and was once home to magnificent civilizations. As we explore these deserts, we'll be following in the footsteps of the pharaohs and Moses, of the Nabataeans and of all the mythical heroes of ancient Greece and Rome. We're off to discover temples built by the hand of man to honor the gods, and masterpieces created by nature to dazzle man, and so we set our course for Egypt and the treasures of the Red Sea. Our voyage will begin here, in Hurghada, an Egyptian seaside resort about 400 kilometers southeast of Cairo. It's here in this colorful marina with its sailboats and little yachts rigged up for diving that we await our cruise ship, the Harmony G. But before we cast off and head for the Sinai, we're going to make a trip to Luxor and the Nile Valley. We head out in a convoy, escorted by an army vehicle. The road to Luxor is 300 kilometers long across Egypt's eastern desert. After four hours in a straight line, interrupted only by a few police roadblocks, we see our first palm trees. Now we're entering into another Egypt green and lush, an Egypt blessed by the gods thanks to the generosity of the Nile. Our excursion to Luxor is not merely for the pleasure of taking a sail in the Falouka. We're seeking to understand just what the relationship was between this Egypt of the river and the Egypt of the sea back in ancient times. We know the vital role played by the Nile and its floods in the wealth of the country. The annual floods, which gave it irrigation and thus an abundance of produce, allowed the population to settle in the valley on either side of the sacred river and as far as 40 kilometers inland. You can easily see why this was where the rulers chose to establish their capital and erect the major sanctuaries. But it's quite puzzling that there's not the slightest trace of a city or a temple on the shores of the Red Sea. The Temple of Karnak, which the Egyptians call the most sacred of places, is without doubt the largest complex of buildings ever constructed in Egypt. Pylons, obelisks, temples, kiosks. Over a period of nearly 1,500 years, each successive pharaoh made his contribution to its beauty and grandeur. Apart from the stone, most of the products and materials were imported. Wood from Lebanon, ore from the Sinai, gold, ivory, ostrich feathers from Ethiopia, gum and frankincense from Yemen. The whole system functioned as if Egypt, turned in on itself in the Nile Valley, opened up to the rest of the world only to draw from it the resources that it needed. Consequently, the pharaohs turned away from the sea. For the priests, allies of the power in place, this isolationism was a way of maintaining a distance between the people and the ideas that could penetrate from the exterior. The Red Sea, like all seas, eventually was considered cursed, 
and shipwrecks were considered as divine punishment. This is surely why the ancient Egyptians were never great navigators, and even the smallest voyage across the Red Sea or Indian Ocean was hailed as such an exploit that it was engraved in stone. The Nile was everything for the ancient Egyptians. It was vastly more important than the Red Sea. So they had an extremely close relationship with the Nile. And that's exactly why they preferred to settle along the river. And so the Red Sea was more remote. Despite the great distances, the Egyptians did send out expeditions to the shores of the Red Sea. Their mission was to extract gold and gems from the mines in that region. Among the many expeditions that were sent out to the Red Sea, the most well-known was undoubtedly the one ordered by Queen Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut had the account of the expeditions that she sent to the land of Punt, present-day Somalia, inscribed in stone. Thus, she has left us a precious testimony on the commercial exchanges in ancient Egypt. It's likely that other pharaohs, like Ramses II, also sent out similar expeditions. The fact that we know nothing about them is surely because they preferred to be remembered for their exploits as warriors. The sun is setting on the temple of Luxor. This is the time of day when the gods of ancient Egypt would embark on a boat to follow the course of the sacred star, thus showing the faithful the path leading to the afterlife. During the night, the Harmony G left Urgada. In the morning, we're approaching the shores of the Sinai. running a distance of uh, almost 50 miles, arriving in Sarmersheikh, is one of the major ports of uh, tourism in uh, Egypt. The main difficulties here, it is as uh, we used to perform cruising in the European mentality countries. Here the mentality is completely different, but of course in order to succeed and uh, our guest to live happy and satisfied from Harmony G, it is that we have to match our mentality and our services according to their standards here. When we're just a few miles away from Sharm el Sheikh, the pilot comes aboard to give the captain a hand for the final maneuvers. Sharm el Sheikh has become Egypt's in seaside resort. Around 20 years ago, before Egypt, thanks to the Camp David Accords, had recuperated the Sinai Peninsula that had been occupied by Israel since 1967, there was nothing here except for a little village stuck between the desert and the Red Sea. The 
The souvenir shops and the casinos that have made Sharm el-Sheikh famous will have to wait. We're here to discover the desert and St. Catherine's Monastery. The Sinai Peninsula is deeply marked by its religious past. The name itself, Sin, refers to the moon god, subject of worship of one of the oldest cults of the Middle East. But above all, the Sinai evokes the Bible and Moses. The desert was once the realm of the Bedouins, where they could roam freely. Now they have to contend with the road that runs from the sea to St. Catherine's Monastery. But it does give some of them the chance to do a little business with the passing tourists. Day breaks, and the rising sun highlights the mountains with mauve and violet. It's impossible to look on this mountain warmed by the early rays of the sun without thinking of Moses and biblical times. The beauty of this spot leaves one mute with admiration. Those tiny white blotches clinging to the side of the mountain are pilgrims who've spent the night on the summit of Mount Sinai. For believers, it's an experience of a lifetime. The custom of retracing the footsteps of the prophet began back in the third century, when the early Christians came here fleeing Roman persecution. It continued over the next three centuries until St. Catherine's Monastery was founded. The general shape of the monastery with its thick walls has remained unchanged since the 6th century. It's thought that Emperor Justinian ordered the fortification of the monastery in order to protect the Christians of the Sinai, but also to control the trade routes running between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. The outside wall itself displays a remarkable unity of style, but the other buildings are more mixed, for they were constructed over more than 10 centuries. In the 11th century, for example, a mosque and its minaret were added to the monastery, surely as a clever way to make it inviolable to the rising Muslim aggression. The monastery houses a magnificent collection of manuscripts. Father Justin, an American priest from Boston, has been in charge of it for nine years. Hammett, a young Bedouin, is his assistant. Books are amazing things. They contain the collected wisdom. And when you think of the time and the labor needed to prepare the scans, to write out the text, to bind it together into a manuscript, you realize that each manuscript represents a huge amount of work. And then when you look above and you see thousands and thousands of manuscripts, you realize that this is the work of generations of monks over many centuries. Some of the most beautiful manuscripts here are made in the imperial scriptoria of Constantinople. They have gold on the pages, they have beautiful paintings, they have elaborate bindings, sometimes with silver and gold and precious stones. They could only have been done in the imperial workshops of Constantinople. But you have manuscripts that we know written here at Sinai using the most simple and basic materials at a place that life was difficult, it was always very austere and hard to sustain life in this place. Well, I think everyone is here because they love the heritage of Sinai. We have 17 centuries of a continuous monastic presence here at Sinai. So from the very, very dawn of the monastic presence, already there were monks living here at Sinai. The earliest surviving pilgrim account dates from about the year 380. Algeria came from Spain to Jerusalem and she continued here 
Sinai was always part of the Holy Land. If you had the stamina and the time and the resources necessary to make the journey, then when you made your pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you continued on to Sinai. And even in the fourth century, she worshipped at the places where we still have churches today, and she witnessed a flourishing monastic life, so it had already been well established here towards the end of the fourth century. The traditions and heritage of the Sinai were born in divine revelation, in particular, the episode of Moses and the burning bush. And here, tucked away in one of the oldest parts of the monastery, in the shadow of the surrounding wall, pilgrims can admire the burning bush. This extremely long-lived shrub, named Rubus Sanctus by the botanists, is found only in the Sinai. Such a sacred bush. Since we express our surprise that it's not more famous and fetid, one of the monks reluctantly admits that it is not, in fact, the original bush, but merely a distant descendant. Botany to the rescue of religion? Well, no comment. I think that our most important mission is prayer. This may be difficult to understand for people living in today's very materialistic world, but it's a fact. Nevertheless, in all the monasteries, you'll find philoxenia, hospitality, or rather, spiritual hospitality. We offer hospitality to people who come to visit for a day, to admire, to appreciate the state of grace that reigns here. The monastery welcomes visitors every morning, simple tourists, but also pilgrims, mostly Greeks, for St. Catherine's belongs to the Greek Orthodox Church. Father Justin is now in the process of digitizing the library's archives to make them available on internet. Hamid comes in for a few hours a day to help him with this Herculean task. It's not easy to live these two lives, sedentary city life and Bedouin life. That's why we try to preserve our customs that are part of the Bedouin tradition, while at the same time maintaining the contact with the outside world, the modern world. We're open to education, but at the same time we respect our traditions. I think that the Bedouin way of life will eventually die out. There's been a profound change because a good number of Bedouins have left the desert and settled in the cities, even though others do continue with their traditional way of life. As for our relationship with the monastery, well, in a way we're in charge of protecting the monastery and its visitors. 
The Bedouins of St. Catherine's Monastery belong to the Jabalia tribe. They say they are descendants of Byzantine soldiers from Romania, who came to the Sinai in the 7th century to protect the monks. Even though they were converted to Islam centuries ago, they continue to maintain a close relationship with the monastery. will soon be leaving St. Catherine's. The dying rays of the setting sun caress the mountaintop, drawing the day to a close. A special moment when some of the monks like to come out onto the terraces to enjoy the warm light of dusk and the beauty of this valley blessed by the gods. We're back in Sharm el Sheikh in Nama Bay. The coast of the Red Sea off the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula is world famous for its breathtaking seabeds. Every morning, hundreds of boats get ready to head out for the dive spots. This area, we call it Ras Muhammad, the national park. There is southern of marine life over there. And usually because of the currents as well, currents from Gulf of Suez, current from Gulf of Aqaba, and current from the Red Sea itself, it mixed together and bringing all the nice stuff around this area here in the, this Venezuela. And it's a protecting area, starting to become organized from the Egyptian government in 1982. And there is uh, one of the top 10 dives around the world, which is Shark and Yolanda Reef over there in this one as well. Yeah.
Red Sea, which was formed 25 million years ago when the Arabian Peninsula broke away from the African continent, has a unique ecosystem. A dive at Ras Mohammed is an explosion of colors and forms. Over 1,200 species of fish thrive among these reefs made up of 250 kinds of coral. Good. What did you say? What did we say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw so a nudibranch, a lot of nice corals, a lot of clownfish, and what we saw? Groupers, snappers, and a lot. Exhausted but happy, we head back to Sharm al Sheikh. Back on board, we go up to the bridge where the captain is holding an impromptu reception. The beauty! The beauty! You enjoy to receive the people, passengers in your bridge? Of course, it is great pleasure. And especially feeling like the host of the boat, they are the guests in my house and they got exactly the, the, the same treatment as they face in my home. And I'm always very pleased. And you see the results, everybody up here. This is octopus. Don't get me. <laughs> <laughs> 
we'll take advantage of our last evening in Sharm el-Sheikh to visit the souks. Here, the spices and silks from India and Arabia that used to come across the Sinai by caravan are displayed side by side with the local handicrafts and the unavoidable souvenirs stamped ancient Egypt. Once night falls, Nama Bay starts to look like Las Vegas. Mile upon mile of casinos, luxury hotels and shopping malls. As if they were trying to outdo each other in kitsch and glitter to attract the tourists. Harmony G has left Sharm el-Sheikh. We're now heading north to Aqaba in Jordan. Just a few kilometers from Aqaba is one of the most stunning treasures of the Red Sea, Petra. Jagged, broken cliffs, sculpted and deformed by wind and water. Petra is there before us, yet remains invisible. Sheltered by this chaotic landscape, the Nabataeans created an organic city that owes its force and beauty to the constraints imposed by nature. Here in Petra, the thick limestone plateau that covers the southern part of Jordan has split open to reveal stunning deposits of sandstone, some white, some red, that make up the setting of the city. These faults were formed by the upheavals of the earth, then sculpted by erosion. Mohammed, an archaeologist, is the director of the Petra Museum. Today he's out in the field to meet with the American crew, restoring the Great Temple. Their territory stretched north to the region of Uran and to the plateau of Damascus. To the south, as far as Madain Salih, in the Arabian Peninsula, to the west to Gaza, and to the east, all the way to the edge of the Badr al-Sham desert. The Nabataeans, who came from Arabia, 
migrated to Jordan in the 6th century BC. Originally nomads, they gradually gained control of the caravan trade. Here, they took advantage of the protection provided by nature and made Petra a major stopover on the trade routes that carried frankincense, spices and myrrh from east to west. The Sikh, a narrow gorge over one kilometer long, is the main access to the ancient city. An arch bridging the two cliff walls once marked the entry. The narrowness of the passage, which in certain spots is only a few meters wide, and the 100 meter high cliffs facilitated the protection of the city. Here, the vestiges of a group of statues representing a man leading his dromedaries remind us of the importance of the caravan trade and the strategic position that Petra held on the routes of the Middle East. The trails that struck out to the Negev and Gaza gave access to the Mediterranean and the Syrian ports, whereas the link with the Red Sea favored exchanges with Arabia and Mesopotamia. In addition to trade, the Nabataeans were also highly skilled in hydraulic engineering. They built dams into the faults to retain runoff water, which was then channeled into the city. come around a bend in the gorge, and there before us, like a mirage looming up out of the shadows, is a stunning pink facade between the dark cliff faces. A monument that embodies all the mystery and magic of Petra, al Kazne, the treasury in Arabic. 39 meters high, 28 across, al Kazne, created in the first century BC during the reign of Aretas III, is Petra's best conserved monument. It was carved directly into the cliff face, starting from the top and working down. The traces of the scaffolding and ladders are still visible. The ground level, made up of a portico with a pediment and six Corinthian columns, is adorned with statues. The damage was, for the most part, the work of Christian or Muslim iconoclasts. The very elegant upper level is composed of three elements. In the center, a small round shrine with an urn on its roof, flanked by the two halves of a split pediment. The lower city that stretched beyond the Sikh had a market, public baths, temples, and of course, villas. The Nabataeans didn't live in the stone monuments, which were used only as places of worship or tombs. The strength and wisdom of the Nabataeans resided in their capacity to adapt their way of life, their religion and their culture to the dominant powers of their time, and yet remain true to themselves. The great temple, which is gradually being restored by a crew of American archaeologists, is indeed a Nabataean temple, even though it looks very much like a Roman construction. It is a lot more than 10 down. 
minutes, uh, fifth, uh, about 13 down. It was always a dream to be able to work here and to uncover its glorious past, the past of the Nabataeans. This is a magical site. This is a site that holds so many secrets. And we have been able to uncover the Great Temple, which is the largest freestanding structure in Petra. And it belongs from the first century BCE to the first century AD. As you know, the Nabataeans were independent for a very few years until they were taken over by the Romans in 106 CE or AD. So this is a very special and poignant uh, time capsule of who the Nabataeans were and how they built their capital. Carved into the red rock of the Jebel El Kubta, which overlooks the lower city, are the royal tombs, another of Petra's marvels. There have been no archeological discoveries proving that these are indeed the burial places of the sovereigns, but their size and the refinement of the adornment go a long way in confirming this hypothesis. The Corinthian tomb with its massive half columns has been damaged by time and the elements, but it is still a magnificent example of the classical Nabataean style. Forty-nine meters wide and forty-five meters high, the palace tomb is Petra's most imposing monument. With its clearly Hellenistic style, it stands out from all the others on account of the upper level with its row of 18 columns topped with their Nabataean capitals. Behind the sober facade of the urn tomb lies a vast chamber. The walls seem to be covered by moiré fabric. The Bedouins are gathering their goats, a sure sign that evening is approaching. The Bedouins live in the nearby village of Wadi Musa. Up until a few years ago, many of them were still living in the tombs of Petra. We're headed to a remarkable desert of rocks just a few kilometers from Petra to visit Wadi Hram, the final treasure on our voyage through the Red Sea. The world discovered the breathtaking beauty of Wadi Ram with the film Lawrence of Arabia. But well before Hollywood's adventure story, the Bedouins were already living here in the middle of the desert. Four-wheel drive vehicles may have phased out the camel caravans, but the Bedouins are still very attached to their traditional way of life. We have goats, we have sheep, and we have camel. 
with no tourist we walk with uh, our family in desert if he want to give it to me many many things and elephant city i didn't give it him this mountain i prefer to go in desert it's very quiet sure it's very quiet and i like it this life because i'm be free i can go where i want in desert nobody say no Almost 1,000 years before the advent of Islam, these Okur mountains were a meeting place for the Arab tribes. At that time, the villages of Wadi Ram were part of the Nabataean Confederation. They acted as way stations and gave protection to the caravans traveling from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Here at the foot of the mountains of Wadi Ram, archaeologists have unearthed rudimentary temples, simple squares marked off on the ground by lines of stones. Saba Faris, archaeologist and epigraphist, is going to give us even more conclusive evidence that Wadi Ram was inhabited in remote ancient times. This is the writing that is most common in the region and that is found throughout the Arabian Peninsula, especially in the north. It's called North Arabic. It's also called Tamudian, from an ancient Arab tribe, the Tamud. Most of the inscriptions are invocations to the divinities. Here, it's to Allat, a water god, because there's a spring nearby. The other divinity that we find here is Aishal, the deity of cattle. Normal people would use this form of script. Whereas the Nabutean form of writing that you see in Petra, and in a few spots around here, was the writing used by the people in power. But ordinary people used this one here. The innate curiosity of the traveler has drawn us to discover these breathtaking sites. The Sinai, Ras Mohammed, Karnak, St. Catherine's, Petra, and Wadi Ram. Some of these are the fruit of man's ingenuity, others are a gift of nature, but they all moved us more deeply than we had expected. Just as the sun is setting over Wadi Ram, I watch with admiration and a touch of envy how Mohammed is enjoying the present moment. Far from being blasé about the beauty of the setting sun, he's savoring this instant as if it were his last. Perhaps this is what is called wisdom, or more simply, happiness. <laughs> 